Today we make choices. We had to make a choice to be in church today, even though the clock changed. The consequences of choices we make reveal whether we made the right or wrong choice, good or bad. So you look at the consequences and we know what kind of a choice we made in life. Therefore, I gave the title, Choices and Consequences. We are going through the life of Abraham. From Genesis chapter 12, we covered that. In chapter 13, we covered last Sunday. Today, I will try to cover a small chapter, chapter 14. When the herdsman of Lot, that is Abraham's nephew, and Abraham's herdsmen had a quarrel. They were fighting. So Abraham said, we should not have this kind of a discord in our family. I'm not going to go back and kind of repeat everything that I preached. They got riches from Egypt. They both became rich overnight. When they came back, they started, not they, their servants started fighting. So Abraham gave a choice to Lot. I want you to look over and find a choice land. Wherever you want to go, it's fine with me. Take that and go. Abraham made a choice. The choice is, I want you to take the first offer. So Lot decided that he would go to two wonderful cities of their time, Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were rich towns. And also, they were built on the sides of Jordan River Valley. I'll put a picture up there. To your left, that's an artist rendition of how he might have looked. Nobody you know, knew how it looked. But then, reading the history of that place before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, it was a lush green river valley, Jordan River Valley. And you see the waterways all the way on top of the page. As you could see here, that top of the page is at the edge of Jordan River coming down to Dead Sea. Those two cities are not there. One on one side of Jordan River. It was not a Dead Sea back then. It was a beautiful river, river valley on both sides. On one side, the archaeological evidence prove Sodom existed. On the other side, Gomorrah existed. Both beautiful towns on both sides of the river, not the Dead Sea. It is named Dead Sea because of God's punishment. We'll get to that later. And then became the Dead Sea, filled with sulfur. Brimstone is sulfur. But after Abraham made the choice of giving the best to Lot, the Lord appeared to him and said, Abraham, I want you to walk up north, south, east, and west. Wherever you go, that land belongs to you. Take it. So what Abraham did is found in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. I don't see his name there, but his action is recorded. Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Abraham had every right to own things that was given to him. But he decided that he would become selfless. He took care of his ambition. He was not conceited. He was so humble and told his nephew Lot, Take. My choice is that I want to give the best to you. 
Abraham made a choice. And the result of the choice, the consequences of the choice, was a great blessing of God. Lot's choice, even though it was a beautiful, lush green place with twin cities, it ended up in disaster later on. But for now, in this chapter, Lot became prosperous. It took several years for them to build their lives in those two cities. And Lot was probably richer than Abraham at this point when it comes to 14th chapter. And then, of course, we know bad choices lead to trouble. Fill in the blanks. The very first point that I gave. Bad choices lead to trouble. Bad choices might lead to a temporal enjoyment. Lot was enjoying, of course. His entire family was spread out in those two towns. He was enjoying the lush green river valley, enjoying the riches he got from Egypt and the riches of the town. He became a rich man, enjoying it, temporal. In the book of Job, we read Job 4.8. Job 4.8. For I've seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. And the time has come for us to read the consequences of the choice that Lot made. A war broke out. If you read chapter 14, verse 1 through 10, I'm not going to trouble you with all those names. Very difficult to pronounce those names. If you read verse 1 through 10, you would find there were five kings and there were four kings up north. The southern five kings... That includes the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. They were not content with what they had. They were rich. So they decided, we're going to rebel and declare war against those four kings from north. So these guys were not content with what they had in Sodom and Gomorrah in that lush green river valley. They wanted to conquer other kings, four kings up north, not knowing those four kings are mightier than these kings. They didn't care. The richness of Sodom and Gomorrah made these kings to find things that, that are not theirs to begin with. It's like Russians right now. Compared to U Ukraine, they're rich. Russians, they don't need the Ukrainians. They don't need the Ukrainian territory. Greed. So Sodom and Gomorrah, out of greed, they wanted to declare war. Now let me read chapter 14, verse 11 and 12. So the enemy, meaning those four kings, took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all the provisions, and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abraham's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom, and his possessions, and went their way. I would add, later on I would read, not only Lot's possession, his wife, his children, his entire family. They became POWs, so to speak. And those four kings took everything Lot's family owned, everything, including them, the whole family, gone, up north. <laughs> Overnight, Lot lost everything. The choice he made to leave his uncle in the dark with the barren land and take the best land now brings trouble, bad consequences. So he lost everything. He's not in, not, not, he was not there, taken captive. 
the news comes to Abraham. Now verse 13. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, underscore the word Hebrew, I'll get to that, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorites, the brother of Eshcol, and Agner. They were allies of Abraham. In other words, even though Abraham did not have a whole lot in that barren area, he had the wishes of his neighbors. They were friends allies. They were living in harmony with one another. Abraham with these guys that are living around Abraham. Amorite, Eshcol, and then of course Anor. These guys were friends of Abraham. So a guy escaped from this invasion, runs to Abraham and tells him, your nephew Lot and his family, all the riches are all gone. Sodom and Gomorrah lost everything. Now, Abraham had to make a choice. If I were in his shoes as a human being, Lot made his bed, let him lie in it. I don't care. He cheated me, and he took the best, so he deserves it. Let him suffer. Some so-called Christians behave that way, even today. If someone falls into sin or does something wrong, some so-called Christian would say, let him, let her suffer the consequences. Then they'll realize the kind of mistake they did. Abraham was not that kind. He never had that holier-than-thou attitude. Although Abraham was holier, better person, godly person, a wonderful leader, he could have behaved the way that you and I probably would behave in his shoes. Lot made his choice, let him suffer. Why do I care? I have my allies, I have my riches. Who cares about Sodom and Gomorrah? My life is fine. I don't need to worry about him. He's alive, that's all I count. Let him be in the, in the prison of those kings. Maybe he'll realize what he did to me. He did not think about that. Many Christians sometimes would see a speck in somebody else's eye and forget they have a beam in their eyes. Become so judgmental. They began to, to see somebody else's mistake, not realizing they got a big old beam in their eyes. Abraham did not want to do that. Abraham made wonderful choices now for the first time Abram, the Hebrew, the word Hebrew is mentioned for the very first time in the Bible here, given to Abraham. Now, how in the world he got that name, Hebrew? We, we think about Hebrew language. We think about the people of Hebrew, Hebrew country. The meaning of the word Hebrew means on the other side or the one who crossed over. On the other side, a one who crossed over. Perhaps they called him because Abram crossed over Euphrates River, crossed over Jordan. He probably crossed over many, many other places. So they gave the name to this man, Abram, or Ab Abram at that point, is that he is a Hebrew. He crossed. There's another definition that we can search in the scripture because Abraham's ancestor, was a man by the name of Eber. And the children of Eber were called Hebrews. We don't know which exactly those people had in mind when they called Abraham for the first time Hebrew. It could be that they knew Abraham comes from the family of Eber, or he crossed over rivers to come here. Regardless, Hebrew, the name was given to Abraham for the first time. So Abraham decides, non-judgmentally, without any revenge in his heart, he was going to gather 318 men, grew up in his house, probably young guys, like 17, 18, and 19. So that tells me that these young fellows traveled with Abraham for many, many months. Now turn with me, if you will. Chapter 14, if you're there, right there, verse 14 through 16. 
14 through 16. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Let me stop right there. Place called Dan is about 100 miles away from Sodom and Gomorrah, or from Abraham's place, 100 miles. And then, beyond that, Dan is another place. Let me continue reading verse 15. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah. Hobah is north of Damascus, Damascus in Syria. There's another 50 miles. So Abraham, with 318 men, grew up in his house, trained men, pursuing those four kings, going after them, chasing them up north, as far as Dan and Hobab, which is 100 miles, 150 miles. Then, verse 16, he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. Why would Abraham go and rescue his nephew who took the best, left him in the desert? The only reason I find here is Abraham left the judgment to God. By leaving the judgment to God, Abraham was free in his heart. He did not judge Lot immediately. He said, the choice that Lot made, that's between him and God. He would face the consequences in God's appointed time if he has not repented. Abraham knew, knew that in his heart. Therefore, who am I to judge? Because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, I want you to turn with me, if you will, and I want to read that to you. It's important. Luke 6, 37. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Underscore that. Abraham did not judge, therefore he was not judged. Abraham did not condemn his nephew, his kinsman. Therefore, he was not condemned. Abraham forgave Lot in his heart. Otherwise, he would not have gone to rescue him. Why would he sacrifice 318 young men? He didn't know the consequences of what is going to happen, the result of the war. But he said he believed in God. He knew in his heart he was going to win. Therefore, he pursued the kings, four, four of them. He got victory because he was not judging, condemning. He was forgiving God. Great lesson, folks. Sometime we become judgmental. We condemn others. We don't forgive. But God said, when you do that, God will do the same thing to you. Abraham knew that in his heart. Therefore, he went to rescue. So number two, good choices lead to blessings. Abraham made great choices in his life. The first choice, not to look down upon his nephew Lot. The second choice he made, I am going to take my men and go and fight for Sodom and Gomorrah, the prideful cities. I don't care. I'm doing the best I can to rescue. Good choice. So Abraham won the war. He took back Lot and his family, those two kings, they were coming back after winning the war. Took all the spoils with them, gold, silver, everything. 
these kings robbed from Sodom and Gomorrah. Everything. So they were returning. Returning back to their place, 100 miles a walk maybe, with people, with families, with gold, silver, everything that was taken by those four kings got it back. Now let me read verse 17, Genesis 14. After his return from the defeat of Keterlemur, that's how it is being spelled, Keterlemur, and the king who were with him, Keterlemur was one of the kings, the king of Sodom went out to meet, who? Meet Abraham at the valley of Shiva. It's called King's Valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. There are so many first occurrences in, the, in this passage. I want you to kind of follow me. The word Melchizedek, mentioned first time in the Bible here. It's only two other Bible books we find the name. One is the book of Psalms, the other one is the book of Hebrews. I'll get there. But I want to, I want to give you the meaning of everything that we read in this passage. The first name, Melchizedek, means king of righteousness. Now this king, Melchizedek, he was from Salem. It's not Salem, North Carolina, or Salem, wherever it is, Virginia. But Salem is an ancient name for Jerusalem. I want you to know that during the time of Abram, Jerusalem was not even built. It was not in existence. Jerusalem was built later. Mount Hebron was there. Remember Abraham went to Mount Hebron. Shechem was up north. A place called Bethel was there. Ai was there. Jerusalem was not there. But the name is mentioned here. Salem. This king of righteousness is from Jerusalem. What is the meaning of the word Jerusalem here? City of peace. A place of peace. Now think with me. Melchizedek is the king of righteousness. He is from a place called Salem, which is called the place of peace. And he is also a priest. First time ever the word priest is mentioned here, just like Salem and Melchizedek. There was not a priest in existence at that point. Priestly duties came into place when God called Aaron, brother of Moses, made him a priest after many years of Abraham's time. A priest simply means a person who represents people to God. First time we find the word priest. And then this priest, Melchizedek, king of righteous, from the place of peace, he also represents someone else. God Most High. El Elyon is the Hebrew word used there. El Elyon means ultimate supreme God. Ultimate supreme God. Now put all these meanings together. Abraham is returning so tired. Day and night they got to pursue those enemies. And walking back, maybe on a donkey's back, we don't know, but they were coming back traveling 100 plus miles with all people they rescued and all the riches. He was so tired. And who is coming in front of him is this person by the name of Melchizedek. The only conclusion that I would arrive on all 
I can't say all, most if not all of the, the theologians conclude because this was the first time king of righteousness is mentioned. First time a place called peace that is representing mentioned. First time the name priest was mentioned. First time we find that he is representing the most high God mentioned, ultimate supreme God. Melchizedek was none other than Jesus Christ pre-incarnate. How would I say that? Now turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 through 3. That would give you the definition. Hebrews 7, 1 through 3. For this Melchizedek, now Paul is writing this. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. Now look at the, the definition Hebrew gives. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God. He continues a priest forever. Now, who do you qualify? No priest would live forever. No king is without father, mother, or genealogy. So the only conclusion you would give, he is likened to the Son of God, Jesus, pre-incarnate. You would find the same terminology used when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fire King Nebuchadnezzar sees there was a fourth man in the fire, like unto the Son of God. It was Jesus, pre-incarnate, appeared to Abraham the first time, because the other time we find was in the book of Genesis, in the beginning, that when God created man, Adam, He said, let us make man in our image. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was there. Jesus has no beginning, no end. He's eternal, pre-existed. On Christmas Day, He was born with, with the body of a man. He took the form of a man. He was, he was not created on Christmas Day. He pre-existed eternally. Forever. Here it is. Abraham met the eternal Jesus. The word begotten son. Let me bring it out here. Which means one of a kind. Son of God. He represents God Almighty. So he goes and meets Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek is the one who meets Abraham. Now think with me. He was gone after that. Nowhere to be found, found in, in that place. Nowhere to, to see this Melchizedek priest ever lived in that place. Jerusalem was not there yet. So he is from the place of peace. Now, Hebrews tells me, and also in, in Genesis 14, that God gave him the victory. Can you imagine 318 men going against four mighty kings who defeated five other kings? It was God who gave him the victory. When we make the right choice and do the right thing, we would sense the very presence of the living God. We might even have divine encounter. This was the divine encounter for Abraham. Now, another thing that I realized here is amazing. Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus, appeared to, to Abram as Melchizedek, which is the priestly name, king of righteousness. He never said to Abram, Abram, well done, my boy. I gave you the victory. Go on your way. The first thing he did is to give him some bread and something to drink. That really caught my attention. I was reading that. Every time we think, we think of God caring for our soul, yes, he does. Our spiritual life, yes, he does but he cares for a physical life also. 
He knew that Abraham was hungry and tired. He never said anything else. I don't read in the Bible that Melchizedek had a, a preaching time there. He sat down, Abraham, and said, I'll preach it to you, my brother. He didn't say a thing. He just simply brought food for him and encouraged him. They said, go on your way. Same thing, same thing happened to Elijah. When he was so hungry, fasted, angels brought him food. That's what mission is all about, folks. Why do we go to Kentucky? To give the supplies. Give them the sweatshirts and the blankets for the children. I can preach greatest sermon that I've ever preached in my life to these kids is that God bless you, bye-bye. No. Unless you care for the ones that are physically suffering, your preaching would go above their heads. They're not going to listen to you. You go to India and then preach. But we don't preach empty-handed. We, we, our church and other churches, we support. Here Jesus, pre-incarnate, appears to Abraham saying that, I want you to feed first. Feed you, Abraham. So God takes care of our needs. He knows our physical needs, our mental needs. He knows Abraham was tired, mentally drained as well. So Melchizedek said, I want you to take heart, take rest. He knows everything. Number three, good choice of giving the tithe to the Lord blesses us. Now, the Lord never told Abraham, I want you to give me a tenth. First time we find the word tithe right here. It was Abraham's idea. When you go back and read verse 20, Genesis 14. And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Tithe. Abraham took the spoils of gold and silver. So Abraham decided in his heart, there's no law that I should give to God. There's no law of tithing. There's no law of giving to God. Nothing of that nature. But he decided, first time ever, that I'm going to make a choice here. I'm going to give tenth of everything that I have right now. He could have taken everything to himself. He need not have given to anybody. As a matter of fact, the king of Sodom said that, saying that you take it all. Just leave our people. I'll take our people. You take silver and gold, everything you got. But Abraham decided that he would give it to God. He knew God is not a debtor. He will bless Abraham with underfold. He knew it. He gave the victory. He's going to give him the blessings. Malachi 3.10. I preached on that quite often. Malachi 3.10. Let me read that to you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in, your, in my house and thereby put me to test. God is saying, test me, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there's no more room for it, <laughs> no more need. So I put something for you in your notes and up on the screen. Tithe is not giving to the Lord. I think we should probably take that phrase out, giving to the Lord. We're not giving to the Lord. It is returning to the Lord part of what he had given. It is not that Abraham was trying to give to the Lord. He's only returning what God gave him, the spoils. So what we have is the Lord's. Our house belongs to the Lord. Our cars belong to the Lord. Our families belong to the Lord. Our bank balance belongs to the Lord. Everything we have belongs to the Lord. He gave it to us. And it is our joy and privilege and a blessing to give God back from what He has given. It is not we are giving from ours. Abraham said that and set an example for all of us. We're giving back to God what He gave us. That's why he used the word tithe. One-tenth. 
Good choice of giving tied to the Lord blesses us. Now, finally, good choice of not being greedy would make a person generous. Have you seen generous people? I've seen rich folks that are so stingy. They won't part with anything. They hold on to their riches. They don't give it to anybody. I've seen those that are generous who are not greedy. It's amazing quality. Choice of not being greedy. Now, Genesis 14, and I close with this, verse 21 through 23. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods with you. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap. I like the definition he gave. I will not take the thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you say I have made Abraham rich. Then, verse 24, the, 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 it's amazing. What Abram said is the last verse. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the shares of the men who went with me. Let Anner, Eshkol, and Mamre take their share. It's a great lesson. When the king of Sodom said, you take everything. You deserve everything. You won the victory. He said, I ain't going to touch even the strap of the shoes. Not me. But I want you to bless those guys who came with me to fight. I call that action of Abraham is the Old Testament evangelism. Why would I call that evangelism? Abraham knew these guys, Mamre, Eshkol, and Abner, they only saw God of Abraham through Abraham. They never experienced the goodness of God of Abraham until now. They saw the victory, and they witnessed Abraham selflessly and generously gave everything back. Would not take even a shoelace. And yet, he said, I want you to bless these men. It's a Christian testimony. People are watching how we treat others. Still Abraham going back to the barren land. <laughs> He's not really going anywhere else. He gave all the riches back to Sodom's king, back to Lot and his family, and then blessed those who came to fight with him. They're not Abraham's family. They're neighbors who had never known the Lord Jehovah. He introduced them to the goodness of God. They probably realized this man worships a true God. Great testimony. You are the Bible, most people read. How you treat others is something that others would know of your God through your lifestyle. Christian testimony is tested through how we treat others. And I would like to conclude here. Lot, again, is making a wrong choice. He never said, Uncle Abe, thank you so much. I want to come with you. I suffered. I could have been dead. My whole family could have been wiped out had you not come with 318 men. I don't need any gold. I don't need anything. You take it. I'm so sorry he made a choice of taking the greenery from you. He never said a word. I do not read in this chapter that Lot realized the mistake he made and asked Abraham's forgiveness. He made a choice, took back everything, walked back to Sodom and Gomorrah. So I want you to know, the choices we make decides the outcome. If we made the right and good choice that glorifies God, we never know even 
Jesus pre-incarnate pre could encounter. Through the message of God, through his word, through his presence, somehow at some point would meet you. He would provide for your needs. I'll put in a Bible verse on top of the bulletin, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all the other things would be added unto you. If you're hungry, he would feed you. If you're in trouble, he will come and put his arms around you. If you're in prison of your own life, he's going to come and deliver you. That's the kind of God we worship. He's Jesus, King of Righteousness. He's a God of peace. He represents the Almighty God. In life, we have choices to make. The choice of God and His righteousness will add everything. The choice of greed will lead you to destruction. A choice of generosity would make you to enjoy the blessings of God. Have you met Jesus? Have you seen Him coming towards you? You need to answer Jesus, answer God. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Dear Lord, we all make choices in life. And I pray for those that are listening online and over here. We have not made the choice of saying yes to the Lord Jesus. Oh Lord, I pray that we would open our hearts and receive you. Dear Lord, sometimes we are guilty like Lot. We do make bad choices, bad moves. But Lord, help us not to continue in our bad choices like Lot, but come back to the Lord Jesus. Lord, we want to experience the encounter that Abraham experienced. Help us to seek the kingdom of God first. And he would add everything. It means everything. Whether it's physical, emotional, or psychological. He would meet all those needs. Father, I pray that we would be, we would be like Abraham. Make good choices. What a great testimony it was for him to tell, help those guys, not me. I don't need anything because I have a God who owns heavens and earth, so I lack nothing. Lord, help us not to have judgmental attitude, unforgiving spirit. Help us to take the beam out of our eyes. Lord, it is so sad to see so-called Christians these days so unforgiving, having the beam try to take the speck out of somebody else's eyes. But we know the blessing of God would fall on people like Abraham, would not do tit for tat, but do what is right. Lord, help us do what is right making right choices, right kind of decisions in our lives. I thank you for the life and the work of Abraham that we are going through. Bless this day. Bless our nation. Help us as a nation to make right choices. We have made so many bad choices. I'm scared of consequences now. Pray that you would forgive us, Lord. Help us to make right choices. Pray your presence in our lives. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you. I shall see you on Wednesday as we go through the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. If you can't make it, next Wednesday. Oh, next Sunday. Come again. We'll continue chapter 15. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.